All right, first, everybody, put your hands up. Everybody, hands up. Who's got their cell phones in their hands? Let me check. Who, oh, you set yours down, didn't you? Yeah, I know, Robin. You guys are cell phone addicted. Okay, I'm going to talk about thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome. Why is anti-aging? We're talking about this thoracic outlet syndrome. Number one is because it's like a new thing that's become an epidemic. And you might call it smartphone syndrome or computer sitting at the desk too much syndrome or too much browsing syndrome because it's, in, it's uh, related to uh, you know, using the computer and using your cell phone. You know? He was talking about grip strength earlier and most of you are just getting your grip strength from using your cell phone. Tap, 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 tap. And then, you know, and then you've, that's how you're getting your grip strength. Thoracic outlet syndrome is extremely controversial, first of all. And it's a very confusing uh, condition that I'm going to help you to try to understand in 45 minutes. First of all, doctors say it's underdiagnosed. That means that so many people have it or the initial stages of it, but they don't even know. And then the doctor misses it. And they say, well, it's carpal tunnel syndrome. And then it's overdiagnosed. To, you know, doctors say that um, you know, people who get into work injuries or they have a car accident, some doctors say, well, those doctors always say it's thoracic outlet syndrome because they're trying to get a case started in court. And then it's misdiagnosed because there are 30 different conditions that cause numbness in the hand and the arm, 30 different conditions. And it's not diagnosed because we don't know what it is. We never heard of it. Most doctors just don't understand it. And so one of the most underrated, overlooked, misdiagnosed conditions, and it's very difficult to manage. Doctors uh, don't, ap don't appreciate it, but it, uh, doctors say that it's the most important peripheral nerve compression in the upper extremity. Very common in athletes, very common in people who are working in the computer industry, and those of you that use your smartphone too much. How's that? So here's the thoracic outlet anatomy. Basically, outlet is like a tunnel. So what you have here is you have, a, um, you have the scalene muscles that are the ones that balance your head on your neck. And then there are the anterior, middle, and the posterior scalene muscles. And coming out between them is the the nerves, the brachial plexus, and also the subclavian artery. And then in front of the uh, anterior scalene is this subclavian vein that drains the blood out of the arm. Then this uh, neurovascular bundle, which consists of the, the, uh, the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery and vein, they join together and they pass underneath the collarbone and this subclavius muscle and under, over the top of the first and second rib. And then it goes underneath the pectoralis minor muscle into the arm. So there are three different areas where um, these blood vessels and nerves can be comp compressed in the inner scalene triangle between the scalene front, anterior scalene and the middle scalene and also where they attach at the first rib. Not many people realize that these muscles that stick out from the side of your neck actually attach on the first rib of your and the second rib of your chest. And so if you have muscle, if you have muscle tension in this area, what can happen is that scalene muscle group can lift these ribs into the blood vessels and nerves and actually compress them and cause some radiating numbness or tingling into your arm. Usually in the fourth and fifth digit is where you're gonna feel it first. Sometimes you feel like a swollen hand, your hand feels swollen when you wake up in the morning, your ring is tight on your fingers in the morning. That's another initial symptom because maybe the heart can pump the blood over the top of this compression, but since the vein sort of is like a drain, it doesn't have a lot of pressure behind it, then it doesn't get the blood out of the arm so easily through this compressed area. 
Then it goes underneath the, underneath the pec minor here. The pec minor and this, these muscles right here are involved in the use of the cell phone. Let me explain. Everybody take your right hand and put it on your left chest right under your collarbone, okay? Now you're going to have to do it. You got to have compliance, right? Patient compliance, right? Okay. Now take your hand, uh, your left hand, and put it up to your eyes like you're using your cell phone. Did you feel that little contraction there underneath your hand? Now let it down and do it again. Do you feel it contract underneath your hand? That's your pectoralis minor muscle. What it's doing is it's anchoring the shoulder down to the rib cage as a solid platform to allow you to put your hand with this big piece of meat and balance it, uh, counterbalance that, that uh, shoulder. So every time you go to pick up your cell phone, you're contracting the pectoralis minor muscle. The longer you contract it, the more it becomes damaged, fills up with inflammation, and it starts to contract continuously. So with that, I wanted to go over what the combination of all three of the, uh, these two is when you have the scalene muscles in a spasm, you have the subclavius muscle, the pectoralis minor muscle, the coracobrachialis, and the bicep shorthead. The bicep shorthead is the one we use to hold the cell phone, and the coracobrachialis we use to hold our arm close to our body, like if we have a purse under our arm, and we're holding it tight when we're going through a crowd or whatever, it holds the arm close to the body. And we already know about the pectoralis minor muscle. So this is kind of the initial feeling that you get. Like, yeah, it doesn't feel good in the upper back, and it just like feels very stiff. And that's what happens. Now, this is the problem. When I first started writing my book, there were 48,000 people looking up thoracic outlet syndrome on Google per month. That was a year ago. OK, now it's up to 62,500 people that put thoracic outlet syndrome in Google every month to find out this, what's wrong with them. OK, now that's almost 8% of the population. It's like talking about a million people, and that's only Google. you know. And you don't have Bing and the other ones mixed in there. And you know kids now are on the cell phone constantly. I had this 15-year-old. I'm examining him, and he's got his cell phone in his hand. And I'm looking at the parents. I'm like, can you help me out here? And finally, I just snatched it away from him. And I said, give me that cell phone. Put that down. And the kid had a fit. I need my cell phone in the middle of the exam. I said, you know, no wonder he's got all these neck problems. Now, women are four times more likely to have thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, now if you can't get rid of this problem, and it causes a blood clot in your arm, they're going to operate, and they're going to cut right through this neck muscle right here, and they're going to cut the first rib out and the scalene muscles. Or they're going to take the pectoralis minor muscle out. You know why? Because the doctors can't figure out how to get rid of muscle spasm. And so somebody can't figure out how to get rid of muscle spasm, whoever your therapist is, and they just decide, well, it's just in and out, cut it out. So it's not very attractive. They have a scar there. And the problem is that this incidence of this thoracic outlet syndrome is growing year by year. Because last year, Nielsen rating said that 9.5, uh, average Americans spent nine and a half hours manipulating gadgets, like cell phones, mouses, iPads. And then we got to have a bigger bag to put our gadgets in. And the bag is heavier. And that's why we're putting pressure on our shoulders. Ten and a half hours manipulating little things like the Xbox. And you know what? That's just way too many contractions. You can't contract those muscles for ten and a half hours and not sustain some sort of musculoskeletal problem. Okay? So these are the statistics coming right from the Nielsen. Now, how long has this been going on? 1821, it was first recognized. The first first rib surgery, which was one of the first surgeries ever performed, was done in 1861 in London. Now here are the names for thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, 
neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, venous thoracic outlet syndrome, arterial thoracic outlet syndrome, double crush, hyperabduction syndrome, effort thrombosis, first rib syndrome. My God, too many names. Uh, that's what confuses people. These are the symptoms. Tingling and numbness or burning pain in the arm, neck pain, pain in the shoulder, the trapezius muscles and the collarbone here. You got chest pain. Some people feel like they're having a heart attack and they go in and they get checked and it's actually a ribs out of alignment from pulling them out of alignment with those spasmed muscles. Headaches at the base of the skull, numbness in the, in the fingers. And the cause of this problem is compression. Compression of the neurovascular bundle, compression. Now, compression is also the cause of a lot of uh, problems like herniated discs. Did you know that in Japan, they did a study where they had uh, 497 volunteers that had never had back pain in their entire life, never. And then they did MRI scans on them. And you know what they found? 34% of these asymptomatic patients had huge herniated discs in their back that they did not know they had. So you get a back pain, okay, and you say, oh, it's killing me, I got numbness down my leg, and you didn't have an injury, or maybe you did, and you go to the doctor, and the first thing they do is they do an MRI scan, and they find a herniated disc. How do you know that that herniated disc was one of the 35% that had them before the actual injury, and that was not even the cause of the problem? But next week you're in face to face with a neurosurgeon discussing how to get rid of the herniated disc. Everybody's got herniated discs. They did another study. They said, let's check this out now. What we're going to do is we're going to look at some old records of some people who had larynx problems. They had like problems with their larynx and they did an MRI scan. They didn't have any neck pain with some other problem. They were looking at some MRI scans from before and they said, look at all these people. There's 34% of the people that had these MRI scans for larynx uh, a problem, no neck pain, had huge herniated discs in their neck. And not only that, but 7% of them were actually indenting the spinal cord. No symptoms. But if you got a little fender bender, and the doctor runs an MRI scan and finds a herniated disc that is indenting the spinal cord, I guarantee you he will say, don't get in the car. Don't get into an accident. You could become paralyzed. Come in here. We have to sit down and have a talk. They'll be like having the talk, and you know what? It's absolutely normal. These are the different treatments that are done on thoracic outlet syndrome. Why? Because I looked at 2,500 uh, scientific studies, just medication, injections of um, medication or uh, pain relievers in the scalene muscles, because if they inject it into the scalene muscle and the symptoms subside the next day, then they know the scalene muscle is the cause of the problem, and that's the muscle we have to surgical, surgically resect. We have to surgically remove that muscle. And also medication, um, traction, nerve gliding, ultrasound, muscle stim, and you know, good posture habits, adjustments of the first rib, because the first rib is too high, it's elevated into the tunnel and it's pinching the nerves or the blood vessels, um, you know, fixing your workstation, massage, and exercise. Which one of them by themselves actually corrects this problem? None of them, okay, adequately. And then, of course, I was talking to this doctor, a vascular surgeon, I said, when do you operate on the patient? He said, well, if they come in with thoracic outlet syndrome and then they come back with it a second time, then we figure, well, we better just operate. Well, what if the people got those 16, one of those 16 treatments that's ineffective at re removing the cause of the compression, and then we decide to operate? What if the physical therapist doesn't really know how to do the treatment and we decide to operate? Here's the problem. There's a lot of monkey business going on with thoracic outlet syndrome, at least in America. And part of it is because the 
doctors are making the diagnosis to suit the patient, let's say, the case. People get reimbursed better for surgical procedures if their diagnosis is thoracic outlet syndrome. They can push a surgery through. And also, if there's a work injury, if you're diagnosed with a thoracic outlet syndrome, they can do surgery, and the case value increases. And it's funny that Medicare and Medicaid patients hardly ever get diagnosed with surgery or thoracic outlet syndrome because it doesn't cover the treatments for thoracic outlet syndrome. So I tell my patients, if you want to really get the right diagnosis, go into the doctor's office with $1,000 and tell them, I have no insurance. Could you tell me what's wrong with me? And then you're going to get a correct diagnosis. <laughs> These are the types that they call neurogenic. That means it's pinching the nerves. And venous means it's pinching the subclavian vein, arterial, the artery, and disputed means they can't really figure out where it's coming from, the symptoms. And so, you know, it's kind of funny is that, did you see all those muscles that were contracting that was squeezing down that entire area? And the bundle kind of goes together. So how could it be possible for that shoulder, which is compressing the whole outlet, to pr put pressure on one structure, like one nerve, one artery, one vein? And what's the real, what's the difference if it's one of these as opposed to the other? It's the compression. If we can figure out what caused the compression, then we can rid the body of thoracic outlet syndrome and maybe a herniated disc as well. And the headaches, headaches are also commonly caused by compression. Now, first we have to decide how the body is designed so we can give a, a, the proper treatment. How does the body resist impacts? Like, how come people say that we need these um, sophisticated packaging, like it, shoes that have rubber soles and all kinds of uh, gels and air soles, and yet uh, Ibil um, uh, Bilakai from Ethiopia ran in the 1960 Olympic marathon and won the gold medal running the entire course in Rome barefooted on the cobblestones? the fastest man in the world, ran completely barefoot, 26 miles. And if you understand that the force of the impact is equal to the mass of the body weight times the speed, he was the fastest man in the world. So therefore, he was hitting the ground harder than any of the other athletes as well, because he was running the fastest. Yet, he won the race barefoot. So. Do we really need these shoes with the impact resistance, or does the body have its own natural spring system to protect us from impacts? Recycling of energy. How come when we jump from foot to foot, we get tired, but yet running is jumping from foot to foot, and we can do 26,000 of those, 1,000 impacts per mile, 26 miles in a marathon, not get tired? How come, does anyone ever ask, well, why don't our bones touch when we run? Why, why don't we have pain when we run because we're hitting the ground so hard? Shouldn't our knees clang together? How does that not happen? And how does the blood vessels and nerves get between the bones and the passageways? How does that happen? How does, that, how does the body control the tension? Like if I step down from a curb, I know exactly how much tension to put on my body to, to be able to adjust for the landing. If I jump down from this desk, I'll know exactly how much tension to put on my body to adjust from the landing. So we have these different models to try to explain that. The first one was 340 years ago that said that we use a straight leg and we throw our straight leg out and then we use our back leg to push our weight over the top of the straight leg like a pole vaulting. And then when we tried to ask this, this um, Borelli 340 years ago, well, how do you explain running? He said, well, that's compliant straight leg. Well, nobody could understand it because it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work according to the laws of physics, yet it's the one that we use to, to model all the way we examine people and treat people. Now, then the spring mass model was proposed by Harvard University scientists that said the body has got springs for legs, but they didn't model anything above the waist. They didn't include the spine. 
And then I developed the integrated spring mass model, which includes the spine as a torsion spring with compression springs between it called discs. And then the body is a giant torsion spring. If I stand like this, then my body has got equal weight on either foot. But when I reach forward with my leg, as you can see, I'm spinning or twisting my, my pelvis and my spine, and my foot doesn't land exactly straight ahead from where it was before. It lands more in the midline, so my body actually goes into a torsion state. And then automatically, if I just let go of the back leg, because I've loaded some spring energy into my pelvis and my spine, it automatically throws the body forward for me through elastic energy, not with muscles. And in fact, running is more with elastic energy. So this is a picture of myself at age 26. I haven't aged a bit, right? <laughs> this is in National Institute of Physical Culture and Sports Sciences in Moscow. I ran a course in sports medicine there, and that's Yuri Veroshansky, who developed a, a, a method of training called plyometrics. It's like I jump down from there and I jump back up as fast as I can with minimal contact time to get the elastic elements working so that I can become stronger, and that's why the Russians used to kill us in the Olympic Games. And that's uh, Dr. Press, who passed away last year. He's a good friend of mine. And this is called the spring mass model. And we're going to whip through this very quickly because we need to get into thoracic outlet syndrome. So human spring engineering, actually what happens is the trapezius muscles and the vader scapula suspend the shoulder girdle over the top of the vascular bundle or the tunnel. And the nerves and the blood vessels pass underneath it. Now, when we look at um, first of all, what goes wrong, we have to start looking at reflexes. Reflexes are automatic for you. For instance, I'm going to go over one, the most important one, which is, you know, like, um, is it, the, Sir Sherrington wanted to see if this, now watch what happens to me. I'm going to, to lean to the side, but look at my head. How come my head always is perpendicular to Earth's gravity. And how come my eyes are always on the horizon? No matter what I do, my head always seems to stay straight. And so Sherrington wanted to know, is this something we learn in childhood or is this something that we have built into our reflexes? So he cut the connection between the cerebellum and the midbrain, and then he put the animals through the same test again. And in fact, they were still able to make these adjustments. So we found that, that the actual um, adjustments of the head, when we move, the body moves through different postures, actually are done with reflexes. So you have these different sensory systems that help you to um, make these adjustments. And the main one we're going to look at now is called the vestibular system and also the somatosensory system. Inside muscles, there are actually spindle cells that are interwoven in the muscles. They're kind of like a, they're like a cigar shape. And what they have is they have 10 to 12 different fi filaments in between them that are like elastic filaments. And there's a nerve wrapped around these elastic filaments. And then these are placed in the body, strategically in the muscles, to be able to allow us to determine where the strain is in the frame. So we call them strain sensors. And Golgi reflex organs are between the tendon and the muscle. So if I'm doing arm wrestling and my body, my nervous system thinks I'm going to fracture my arm, it'll automatically shut it down for me to protect me. That's the Golgi sensors. And then we have skin sensors, visual sensors, and vestibular sensors. This is a spindle cell here. Here are the filaments. And these filaments um, have the nerve wrapped around them, goes to the spinal cord and up in the brain to tell you that you have some strain on the body, the frame, and where the strain is. Inside the head, as you know, in the labyrinth, called like the cave of your head, you have uh, the semicircular canals. They're 
on three of them on different planes. And inside there are thousands of hairs inside these hula hoop-like structures. And these little hairs have a gel on top of it. And there's some crystals on top of that gel. And when I lean to the right, by gravity, the gel slides across these hairs and trips these hairs and lets the nervous system know exactly where my body is in space so I can make these adjustments. If you're in your car and you hit the gas and you, your head snaps back from accelerating, that's the gel that's sliding back on these sensors and giving you the um, understanding of acceleration. And so these, um, the vestibular system is very important in balance and coordination. Children's vestibular system starts at a young age from the head down. My daughter couldn't keep her head up. I was like, it kept falling. Come on over here. I got a little nervous, kept falling. Like, okay, keep your head up, you know. But eventually she got her head straight and then her body came up. So now like when you fall down, the first thing that you do is that you bring your head up and then the body follows. That's not something done by accident. Now, what causes this thoracic outlet syndrome compression? I call it muscle super contractions or muscle spasms. Something grows into the outlet like scar tissue, like a pancoast lung tumor, or conditions that we're born with like elongated or cervical ribs, that's extra ribs at the base of the sp uh, neck or you have a bad car accident that shifts the bones, breaks the collarbone, and where the muscle contractions, which is the most common, is a singer over like whiplash, you know, like a car wreck. Ooh, God, I hate those. Like, ugh. And then you're hurting for weeks. Sports injury, football tackle, or, um, you know, work injury. And a, a biomechanical overloading is too many repetitions, like you, you know, typing away, texting your friend who's across the table from you about what you're doing. You know, these young people, you know, they are sitting there in the coffee shop, and they're, and they're all looking down like that. And what are they doing? They're texting each other across the table. It's idiotic. You talk to each other, you know. I mean, you know, that's what tell you how addicted the kids are to these cell phones. And that's why thoracic outlet syndrome creates a tremendous amount of inflammation in the body, especially around the head and neck. I did lectures on inflammation and the cause of depression. And if you look it up, you'll find that there's a tremendous, a tremendous amount of research being done right now about depression and mood disorders and Parkinson's Alzheimer's disorder and the link between that and inflammation. Uh, there were around 3,200 articles in 2012 when I did my lectures on that topic. And then I went to brush up on it because somebody asked me to research or do some more lecturing on it a year and a half later. And there were 1,500 additional articles in PubMed in one year. Now, you accumulated 3,200 articles since PubMed has been around. That's like since the 50s. And then in one year, you got 1,500 additional articles. So the research is ramping up tremendously on the cause of inf from inflammation and, and depression. So these are the muscles that actually, right here in the neck area, the anterior, middle, and posterior scalene, and these are the ones in the shoulder, okay? So what are the other conditions that are caused from depression or compression? He neck pain, uh, headaches, cubital tunnel syndrome, medial compression of the forearm in the, in, the, in the forearm, carpal tunnel, tunnel of Guyon. So there are a lot of conditions that are caused from compression. And let me explain something to you. Simplified, that muscles are the only structure in the body that can compress anything. So if you have a pinched nerve, it's compressed, it has to have a muscular origin. Now, this is called the writing reflex. We talked about this. So people get kind of freaked out when I tell them, you know, that he's got pain on the right side, his wife. She do he doesn't know how to talk. She talks for him. He has pain on the right side shooting down his arm. Oh, he does? Yeah. And I said, I bet he sits 
on the left side of the couch at home. She goes, yeah, he does. How do you know that? And he looks at her and says, when we get home, you close the drapes on the house. That's it. I'm just joking. He thinks that I'm looking in the house at, hey, let's see what you're doing, you know? Just peeping at him, you know? In reality, science tells us that if we lean to the left, then the vestibular system then contracts the muscle on the right side of the neck to hold the head so it's perpendicular to gravity. How about that? So if it's on the right, then the person's leaning too much on the left. If the symptoms are on both sides, then you're leaning back, like watching TV in the bed. Uh-uh. You've got to stop doing that because that's really going to nail you on both sides. This is where you have pain on the, right si uh, on the right side because you're leaning too far to the left. And these are the problems, like leaning back in the bed, watching TV. When in my day, I'm a middle-aged man, so I can say that. In my day, back when I was a kid, we didn't have TV all night long. We didn't have tractor pulls at 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? When midnight, when I was a kid, the TV went off. It was an annoying, annoying noise. It was so annoying, it woke you up when you fell asleep. And then we turned the TV off and we went to bed. Now it's on all night long. You just sit there like this, and watch TV like that, and you have neck pain. This is where the, the, the pillow's too thick or the pillow's too thin. It, you're, if you have your husband or wife take a picture of you from the side when you've got your pillow to see if your neck is straight. Or carrying bags on one side, you lean your head the opposite side. To counterbalance the weight on this side, you lean the head the opposite side because it weighs, the head weighs about 9 to 12 pounds. So now you can see where we can end up with these problems from too many contractions. Looking down on the cell phone shortens the anterior cervical muscles and your neck is like this. You're going to run into something if you don't lift your head up. Okay, I lift my head up, now I lift my head up, and then I lift the ribs up with it because the muscle is shorter or in a spasm. When a muscle's in a spasm, it doesn't need to be stretched because it's not short because it's short, it's short because it's in a spasm. Muscle stre uh, uh, um, stretching actually makes it worse. If you take your head and you go like this, you're pulling with the scalene, lifting the rib up even higher. No, like, no, that's not how you do it, you know. You can't take your head like this and pull your scalene muscles because you're going to lift the rib up even higher. Here's one of the theories. The theory is that when your muscles contract constantly, it kicks out lactic acid, right? Because it's not able to rest and get the oxygen in to make it aerobic. Now it's anaerobic. The acid builds up in the area. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that comes out of the nerve and hits the muscle and causes a contraction. The acetylcholinesterase turns it off. The acetylcholinesterase doesn't work so well in an acidic environment, so that's why the muscle contracts too much. Okay. The other one is that if you have inflammation in your neck, the nociceptor nerves are there as chemical receptors to tell the brain there's injury there. So as long as inflammation is there, it keeps telling the brain there's an injury. And the brain says, I don't know how to fix it. So it just puts it in a spasm again. So you have this, all this circuit that keeps tripping itself over and over again, leaving you in a state of chronic pain. So how do you check for these problems? You have to actually touch people. Imagine, you have to touch them. You have to put your hand on the shoulder and you have to push on those muscles pretty deep and say, is that hurt there? Is it hurt there? That I'm going to give you all the muscles. There's 10 of them. You put your thumb into it, and you feel them to see if there's any pain there. Also, there's some orthopedic tests. Like what I, what I usually do is I take the pulse, and then I bring the arm behind the back. That rolls the collarbone down on the outlet. If the pulse goes away, then the collarbones laying on the nerve, or the blood vessel, rather. Now, then what I'll do is then I'll, I'll tell them to turn the head to the side. If the pulse goes away then, then I know it's coming from the scalene muscles, too thick and swollen, because I'm spinning them. And then what I do is I have them take a deep breath. 
hold it. And then what I'm doing is I'm lifting the rib cage up. See? And the rib, that means the first rib will come up higher. There should be enough room for the blood vessels to pass even when the rib is higher. If the blood if the blood flow stops then, I know it's a first rib that's elevated. So now I can be able to delineate what area it is. Ruse test is just like, hold your arms like this and then do this for about three minutes and if your hands go numb, then you have a compression of the artery underneath the pec minor here. And then what people will do when they have thoracic outlet syndrome is they'll put a pillow underneath their shoulders to lift the shoulders off the outlet and the symptoms go away. That's also called a test, a Syriax test. Now, this is when we do diagnostic testing. Usually, you're supposed to do about four, three to four weeks of therapy first and then you decide to do testing. But doctors are doing testing too soon now because they don't have an understanding of anatomy. They can't actually examine anymore. You know, like, well, we don't need to examine because we have these fancy tests, and the hospitals want us to run those tests because it improves our economic situation. And uh, we want to protect ourselves from malpractice insurance, you know, suits, of course. That's all malarkey. You do need to give a good exam. But these are the x rays, will show the neck is straight or reversed. And then there's some special tests like EMGs, nerve conduction uh, velocity tests, phenograph, uh, duplex scanning is a popular one. But this is a, a venous uh, venography where they actually put the uh, dye into the vein and to see if the actual vein is compressed. The problem is that, so what if it's compressed? We already know that, we did the exam. And that's because there's muscle tension in the area and it's compressing the the vein. Well, the doctor will come back and say, one doctor told me that well, there's, there's scar tissue in there and the 19-year-old needs to have his ribs surgically removed. I said, really, he's only 19? How could he have a scar tissue in the vein that young? Now, these are the different 30 different conditions that can cause thoracic outlet syndrome. Here are all the traumatic ones. And then you have the, the ones that come on over time here. And then you have the tumors and like Raynaud's phenomenon and you have like syringomyelia. Now here's a good story. I had this girl who had numbness in both arms. She was dropping the cell phone, coffee cups, she couldn't have grip strength. And so I did the exam on her and then I found out she had thoracic outlet syndrome. So this was around December uh, 20th. And then on January 1st, this insurance company said, well, you have to send all your records to this guy in New York, and he's going to determine whether you're going to get extra visits or not. You know? And so the guy comes back to me, gives me two visits at a time, and makes me wait a week. And I'm like, I'm losing the, continua the continuity of care here. What's going on? He says, well, I think it's something else. I said, what do you think it is? He said, I think it's a syringomyelia. Oh, really? You know, he's not practicing, he's in the, behind a desk, evaluating my records, okay? I said, did you look at the symptoms? He said, yes. I said, they were a 10, now they're a 4, right, for the numbness, and they're a 10, now a 4, and then pain is now a 4? He said, yeah. I said, well, a syringomyelia is a tumor of the spinal cord. Do you think that with my little manipulations and my muscle work that I'm curing cancer? Oh, well, uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Uh, yeah, it's not a stringomyelia. Maybe you're right. Okay, I'll give you 10 visits. Thanks a lot. Bye. So that's how you figure that out. Disc injuries. Remember, you have to have a trauma. If you don't have a trauma and you find a herniated disc, it's one of those 34% that were there before. Okay? If there's calcification and there's scar tissue all over the disc, it's an old injury. It's not related to the patient's symptoms if they develop them recently. Okay? Now, shoulder diagnosis, like if you have a, a, a collarbone that's fractured or if you have like um, AC joint inj injury or a shoulder impingement syndrome, rotator cuff can, oh, intercostal neuritis where the ribs can actually be jammed or twisted from a car wreck or when you're looking down on the cell phone too much. Um, from the pectoralis muscle, when it contracts too much, it attaches on the third, fourth, and fifth rib 
and that's the pain between your shoulder blades. The scalene muscles are attached to the first and second rib, so the pain up here in the neck here, that's the scalene muscles. And then you have these carpal tunnel one, which is only from the wrist down. So if a patient has numbness here, it is not carpal tunnel. It doesn't go back up, it goes down, the pinching. If it's from here down, then we may suspect carpal tunnel. But if you have numbness in the forearm, forget it. It's not carpal tunnel, you misdiagnosed the patient. Double crush means you got carpal tunnel syndrome, medial uh, nerve entrapment, hyperabduction syndrome, thoracic outlet syndrome, and a herniated disc. You have five different areas of compression. You want to really confuse a doctor, give him a quadruple crush, one of those. So this is one of the worst problems. When this collarbone comes down too far and hits that vein, it can cause a blood clot in the vein. That's called Paget-Schroeder syndrome. This is what it looks like right here. And the problem is if that clot releases, it can go through the, the venous system and into the lung on the opposite side and cause a, a pulmonary infarct. And then you could die from that, okay? Shortness of breath is one of the symptoms. Um, uh, you know, uh, increased respiration <sighs> or uh, heartbeat, increased heartbeat, uh, rapid heartbeat. And this is how it's diagnosed with the, um, or the now with the obstruction. Now, when you have the blood clot, you're, we, you put a catheter in and then you put clot busters in and it will dissolve the clot if it's caught in time. And then they'll decide whether they want to uh, surgically resect the rib and the, and the muscles after that. Now in Stanford University, they had 37 patients that they decided not to surgically decompress by cutting the rib and the muscle out. And actually uh, a number of patients, quite a few, I think it was around 27 patients actually were able to uh, live normal lives without having the surgery to uh, decompress the area. Tumors we went over, and then cervical ribs. Now, if you have a patient that has been normal for 25 years, and all of a sudden they have numbness in the both arms, and you take an x-ray, and you find these extra ribs in the spine, that is not the cause of the problem. Those ribs have been there for, for 25 years, and they didn't cause any symptoms, so why would you think they cause symptoms now? You've misdiagnosed the patient. I'll tell you that having those ribs surgically removed is very painful. And if you're gonna do surgery on a patient that doesn't need it, that's a huge problem, huge problem, because the surgery is not so good. So now the stretching we said is not gonna work. The scalene injections, you know, then you decide whether or not you're gonna actually operate. Well, let me tell you something. The doctors think that thoracic outlet syndrome is the scalenes and the pec minor. I just showed you where 10 muscles are contributing to the compression of the thoracic outlet. So if you do a scalene injection with some uh, painkillers and the symptoms go away, and then you surgically resect the scalenes and you have thoracic outlet come back after the surgery, don't be surprised. Because there are 10 muscles, not two or three that cause this condition. So don't let the doctors tell you that this is going to be a, 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 a good uh, approach to getting rid of this problem. Botox, whatever's handy. You know, doctors lately, now they're injecting Botox for back pain. You know that Botox turns off a muscle for six months? It's like when you put a cast on a kid's arm and you take it off nine weeks later, it's visibly smaller than the other arm. Why would you inject Botox, which causes the muscle not to contract for six months? Now you have thoracic outlet, and then you have a weak neck that's gonna take years to build up. And you know how difficult it is to strengthen the neck? And these the injections, I had one violin player has to have this, they don't even have frets on a violin. They have to feel exactly where that note is. It's just such a fine tuning of the hands and the eye coordination. And this girl had 34 Botox injections in her muscles of her neck and shoulder. What made you think that was a good idea? Now, you have this, all this uncoordinated uh, effort through your hands and you can't play violin anymore. She can't play anymore. She played at the White House, very 
amazing violin player. So, misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, they have thoracic outlet syndrome and carpal tunnel. And these are the muscles that they surgically resect. The anterior scalene, the middle scalene, and the pec minor. What about these other muscles? The short head of the bicep here pulls the shoulder down into the thoracic outlet and the coracobrachialis and that subclavius muscle underneath the collarbone. They're gonna go underneath the, the armpit here, it's called the transa transaxial, where they go underneath the armpit and surgically remove the rib and the scalene muscles with snips and with um, like kind of like, looks like a, um, I'm not even gonna say. And this is, the, this is called the tenectomy, where they cut the pec minor muscle. Of course, you need that to stabilize the shoulder, remember? They're just going to cut it out, and then the shoulder will go back in alignment. Oh, no. Well, this is why I don't like surgery for thoracic outlet syndrome, because it's, it, it, it's, it just starts off on a bad foot because it's not going to be effective. Now, why do they have... The, these are some of the... Um, Outcomes, you could have a clot, you could have pain for the rest of your life, and you can't go back after you have surgery. Here's some results. This is so interesting, I want you to, to listen to this very carefully. So say you got a girlfriend, and she has thoracic outlet syndrome, and you're like, oh, I'm going into surgery tomorrow, and then you're like, oh, God be with you, and hope you are better. <laughs> we all have these... 135 comments on the Facebook. Oh, I hope you're better. If you couldn't, let me know if I could help you. Yeah, please don't get the surgery. Okay, so what happens is they come out of surgery and they say, I feel great. Oh, the symptoms are all gone. Well, here's the situation. These are the way that the doctors determine whether or not the surgery was successful. If you're asymptomatic, you're completely pain-free after the surgery. And or most of the symptoms are gone, with some symptoms remain, remaining is a good outcome. Fair outcome is relief of some symptoms, but the major symptoms are still there. Like, I still have the numbness, I still have the pain in my neck and the shoulder. Oh, okay. And the failed means no results. Well, here's what happens. You go into the doctor and they say, I'm nervous about seeing the, the vascular surgeon. Of course, you're having surgery. Well, don't be nervous. We have a 90% success rate on our surgeries for thoracic outlet syndrome. Oh, wow, I'm much more relieved. That's great. This is how it's calculated. Three people had excellent results. 32 had good results. 19 had fair, which means after the surgery, they still had the major symptoms. Now, do you think that's a successful uh, surgery? You have major symptoms. You get, the thoracic, you get these muscles cut out and the rib resected, and then you come out and you still have the major symptoms. That's not a successful surgery to me, but that's what it's determined as a successful surgery in the eyes of the surgeon. And six had poor outcomes. So then you say, really, in reality, this is 25 and this is 35. 25 had poor results, so really the success was only 58% if you're concluding or taking out those with major symptoms after the surgery. So you have to look at the, the, the results. Now, this is how I found these uh, results because I paid the $40 to get the, to, get the, um, to get the full report. I didn't read the abstract in the, in the, in the uh, PubMed. I, I, I paid the $35, and then the, the journal released the full article to me, and this is what I found, okay? So then you say, well, 254, 86.6. So she comes out of surgery, she's elated. You know, I'm thinking about having surgery too. It's on Facebook, right? So you're like, who's your surgeon? Maybe I'll try him out. But now, here's what happens. 18 months later, the symptoms all come back. How is that possible? Well, of course, you only surgically resected three muscles when nine muscles actually compressed, or 10 actually compressed the outlet. So it was doomed to fail from the beginning, okay? But you, 80, per, 80 of them, 46% of them uh, were successful. That means more than half did, were not. The 80 of them decided to go back and have a second surgery. Let's do another one. And 45 of the 80% had 50% improvement. 
Now that was what they determined was the success rate was 50% improvement. And when at the end, after 72 months, only 36% actually felt like they had a successful surgery. The majority felt it was a poor outcome. Now, let me explain something to you. You cannot have a good outcome when you cut the neck muscles out and ribs because you no longer can get equilibrium balance in your, in your body. You cannot have good posture anymore. So this is what we do. We rope, reprogram the muscle tension. First, we actually sweep all the inflammation and lactic acid out. Then we reprogram the muscle tension with deep tissue work. And now this is the problem. If it takes two minutes for the muscle spasm to go down, and you have 10 muscles, that means it's going to take two hours to get through the whole group of muscles in one visit. There's only 30 minutes allotted to you by insurance. So how are you going to get through all these muscles when there's so many different points to hit? And then we have to restore the joint play. We have to physically adjust the rib down out of the outlet because there are no muscles that pull the rib back down. There's only muscles that pull it up. So there's no other way of getting that first and second rib down but adjustment. There's a faster approach, which is where people are treated three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, and three hours in the evening. And they get better in a matter of days or a week, as opposed to you know, weeks or months. So with that, I, I would like to thank you all for being an attentive audience. And if you'd like to know more about thoracic outlet syndrome, you can go to our blog at thoracicoutletsyndrome.com or you can read my number one best-selling book, The Human Spring Approach to Thoracic Outlet Syndrome, available on amazon.com.